No. No, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, first of all, I'm just great the work you've been doing, and I'm looking forward to learning more about that work and to having a conversation. And towards that end, I, I will probably keep my initial remarks to no more than a half an hour so we can have lots of time for questions and discussion. Uh, it was mentioned that I'm a recovering high school English teacher. I perhaps need to add a sentence or two to that. I'm, in fact, a recovering independent school student, teacher, parent, and head. So I have a particular affinity for the independent school world, although I've spent a lot of time in the public school world as well. So I, that's another reason why I'm, I'm really looking forward to exploring some ideas with you this morning. You know, we in education, I think, are far too fad-driven. I've been in your seat many, many years, the beginning of, of the school year, and there's always some kind of reform du jour, right? Fad of the month, flavor of the month, that 21st century thing. Well, that's apparently the flavor of this month. Uh, that's why I like to start with a quote from Einstein. The formulation of the problem is often more essential than the solution. What's the problem? that 21st century thing needs to solve. We'll talk about three problems, very briefly. Number one, the world of work is changing fundamentally and at an extraordinary pace. There is less and less routine work that our students are going to be asked to do. Almost all of the work they will have to do in the future is what we call non-routine knowledge work. Non-routine meaning work that you cannot do the same way two days in a row. Increasingly, the only routine work that's available is minimum wage work. Problem one. Changing nature of work. What does that mean for us? Problem two. The commoditization of knowledge is happening at a stunningly rapid pace. How many of you have been on the Khan Academy website? Raise your hands. Flipped teaching? How many of you are doing that? You know the phrase? Where you assign the Khan Academy videos at night, and six million students a month, on average, are watching more than 3,200 videos. More recently, you've been reading about Udacity, Coursera, edX. Virtually all of the leading universities just in the last three months, both public and private, have joined various consortia to offer free online courses with certificates of completion. Degrees are going to follow, I'm quite sure of it. The result is that whereas in the past, learning, education, knowledge was a, a rare commodity comparatively. And the only way you could get more learning was through a teacher, right? There are only a few of us who had the papyrus reeds and then the clay tablets. Then Gutenberg came along and we got books, but they were still fairly expensive. So students needed teachers to pass that information along. And the more knowledge you had, the more advantage you had. Both are no longer true. Don't need a teacher anymore to acquire knowledge. It's on the inter internet. And just because you may know something or think you may know something at a given moment in time, if you have a competitive advantage, it's for that long. Because knowledge is changing constantly, growing exponentially on every internet connected device. <laughs> How many of you had to uh, memorize the periodic table in high school? Raise your hands. All right. So if you're not a chemistry teacher, please answer the following question. How many elements are there? Oh, wait. I didn't hear that. Sorry. Well, whatever answer you came up with is wrong, because two more were added last month. And plunet, uh, planets. How many are there? Uh, you know, is Pluto in the club or out of the club today? I haven't read my news. Well, poor Pluto, really, when you think about it. And let's have a contest. Let's see which one of you would care to recite the 50 state capitals from memory while I Google them. <laughs> see who's quicker. You get the point. Knowledge, growing exponentially, changing constantly on every internet connected device. So that's why I did, in fact, say the world cares less and less about how much our students know. What they care about is what they can do with what they know. That's the competitive advantage. That's the new requirement. And that demands more than just knowledge. It demands skill and will. And I want to talk about skill and will. 
as um, was mentioned, I started work in 2005 on a book that became The Global Achievement Gap after having read Thomas Friedman's book, The World is Flat. How many of you have read that book? Raise your hands. Most important, scariest book I've read in a decade, at least. Because he was the first one to introduce me to this rapidly changing world of work where, not, where increasingly routine jobs are being either offshored or automated. Anybody see the Sunday New York Times front page article on automation, roboticization? Stunning. Long article. Have you kids read it? Highly, highly skilled work being roboticized at an extraordinary pace. So this trend has continued. So as I read that book, I wanted to begin to try to understand what are the skills that matter most in the world today and what are the knowledge gaps. So I, I talked to a very wide range of executives, literally from Apple to Unilever to the US military. I talked to college teachers, community leaders, asking all of them, what are the skills that matter most? I talked to recent graduates, something you may want to consider here, asking them in what ways they were most and least well prepared. And I came to discern that there's a set of core competencies every student must be well on the way to mastering before he or she leaves high school. Not just to get and keep a job, but equally important to be a lifelong learner and an active and informed citizen in the 21st century. Those goals used to be seen as mutually exclusive. Preparing kids for preparing kids for citizenship, they have converged. But the skills required for both are the same. What are they? Very briefly, I describe them as the seven survival skills for careers, continuous learning, and citizenship. Some of you are already familiar with this work. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but just review quickly. Critical thinking and problem solving, number one. And as was said, critical thinking, I heard executives say over and over and over again, most frequent response I got, critical thinking begins with the ability to ask the right questions, to ask really good questions. You know, we value problem solving a lot in education, but executives told me that the more important skill is problem identification, which is what Einstein said, the formulation of the problem more essential than the solution. Second skill, collaboration across networks and leading by influence. More and more, all work is done collaboratively, increasingly done virtually. Little problem. How are we in education, which is arguably one of the most isolated professions in modern work life, where we have very few opportunities to do real teamwork in our workplace settings? How are we going to teach skills of collaboration to every kid? How, do we, how are we going to model those behaviors? And how do we ensure that every student learns how to lead peers by influence, not just those kids who rise to the top of co-curricular activities? Third skill, agility and adaptability. Pace of change, the complexity of problems favors increasingly those who are the most agile and adaptable. Fourth survival skill, initiative and entrepreneurialism. It was Mark Chandler, vice president of Cisco System, and then General Counsel as well, who explained to me how executives of large businesses worry constantly about how to keep that spirit of entrepreneurialism and initiative alive so, so that their organizations don't become ossified and bureaucratic. He said something very striking to me, which has even more resonance with me today, as I'll explain. He said, if I have an employee who sets and meets five goals, in other words, 100%, it's no longer good enough. He said, if on the other hand, I have an employee who sets 10 stretch goals, but perhaps only succeeds at seven or eight, he or she is a hero. But what would that person be in our schools? Would have missed two or three out of 10, makes them a C or a B student. I'm gonna come back to this issue. Fifth survival skill, effective oral and written, and now we would add electronic communication, Number one complaint of both college teachers and employers. It was a senior executive at Dell Computer who said to me, no, the reason these kids can't write, and he was talking about college graduates, he said, they don't know how to think. They don't know how to read. They don't know how to construct a coherent argument. And then he said something that warmed my recovering high school English teacher's heart. He said, that's only half the problem. The other half of the problem is they do not know how to write with voice. His exact phrase meaning they don't know how to put their own passion and perspective into their communications so as to be truly persuasive. 
a little sort of take home assignment for you guys. Do a little audit and see how often are your students asked to write with voice, to put passion and perspective into their writing or other forms of communication. Six survival skill, accessing and analyzing information. We already talked about that. Last survival skill, curiosity and imagination. Now, how many of you have read Dan Pink's book, A Whole New Mind? Raise your hands. It's a book worth looking at. Pink makes the argument that we need more of the right brain skills, curiosity, imagination, empathy, creativity, because of the growing sophistication of our consumer economy, where consumers demand ever more creative and empathetic products. That consumer economy and the needs for curiosity and imagination in a very, very different light in, in terms of my new work, which I'll explain. So that book, The Global Achievement Gap, and by the way, The Global Achievement Gap I define as the gap between the new skills all students need versus what is taught and tested even in our very best public and independent schools. Too many of our schools have one curriculum, teaching to the test. Now, I believe, I believe in accountability. But too many of our assessments in very wide use around the world are predominantly multiple choice factual recall tests, the results of which tell us absolutely nothing about college, career, and citizenship readiness. This is one reason why I think advanced placement is completely revamping all of their tests, as you may know. One reason why I'm very critical of not just the public school testing, but also advanced placement. So that book came out four years ago. Two things happened, two big things for me. Number one, I became completely deluged with requests to speak from all over the world. And as I went from Taiwan to Singapore to Thailand to Bahrain, Finland, England, Spain, from West Point to Wall Street, and I don't know how many states around the country, I saw almost a near universal response in reaction to my remarks. You ever seen those bubblehead dolls on the backs of cars? Like this, people completely agreeing. Yep, these are the right skills. So I was beginning to feel maybe I'd made some kind of contribution. But then the other thing happened. And I'm talking about the global economic collapse from which we have yet to recover. Greatest since the Depression, worldwide. And I saw college graduates coming home with an average of $30,000 of debt and no jobs. On un an underemployment rate among recent college grads is 50%. That half have no job at all. The other half have a job that doesn't require a college education. Here we've been telling kids for generations, all you have to do is go to college and all will be well. It's the path to, to an, a good life. And I had naively, it turns out, assumed that if kids went to college, well, of course they were learning many of these survival skills and that was fine. Not true. Both are not true. Neither are they learning the skills, as we learned from recent research in a book called Academically Adrift, which discovered that half of all college kids, after two years of college, were no more skillful in writing or critical thinking, and a third were no more skillful after four years of college. So not only are kids not learning these skills in college, so it's a K-16 problem, but more than that, these skills, while essential, are not enough, I've discovered. Necessary, but not sufficient. Why is that? Well, I began to really try to understand the roots of this economic crisis. And I came to realize that it's far more than credit default swaps in a hyperinflated real estate market. Fundamentally, we have created an economy that is increasingly dependent upon consumer spending as the engine of growth and the creator of jobs. More than 70% of our economy is based on consumer spending. When the economy took a dip after 9-11, what did George Bush say to everybody? Go out and spend. Go take a vacation. Go be a good consumer. Not only do we have an economy increasingly dependent upon consumer spending in this country and elsewhere, but this economy has become more and more reliant on people going into debt 
to buy their stuff. The savings in 2007 was minus 2%. People pulling money out of their houses, putting stuff on their credit cards as fast as they could. I mean, one simple way of understanding the crisis we're in now is all the debts got called in all at once. So I've come to understand that we have created an economy based on people spending money they do not have to buy things they may not need, threatening the planet in the process. It is increasingly clear, and more and more economists from both the left and the right are saying, that economy is not sustainable. Economically, environmentally, I would argue. But what is to replace it? What is to be our engine of growth moving forward? Again, economists are of one mind about this. It's fascinating to see the levels of agreement. Everyone agrees we have to become more of an innovation-driven economy, where more of our economy, more of our jobs, more of our wealth is created by people producing new and better ideas to solve more different kinds of problems, ideas that other people find of value. Now, to be clear here, when I talk about innovation, I'm talking about it in the broadest sense. I'm not just talking about the tech, high-tech stuff. I'm not just talking about STEM. I'm talking about the ability to be a creative problem solver in whatever you do. And I'm not just talking about disruptive innovations like the ones you have in front of you, but also the incremental improvements that are significantly important. Beginning with how do we create a sustainable planet? It's the hugest problem of our time. So innovation, innovation economy, nice word, easy thing to say, fun to think about little question here, little problem. We've always been known as a very, very innovative country, but is that because of or in spite of our education system? A lot of people say it's you know, because of availability of venture capital, copyright protection laws, immigration, infrastructure, all of those things. Here's a trivial pursuit question for the day. I'll ask it so quickly you will not be able to Google the answer. What do Bill Gates, Edwin Land, the inventor of the Polaroid instant camera, Bonnie Raitt, the folk singer, and Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook fame, all four have in common. I'm sorry, they were not college dropouts. They were Harvard college dropouts. That's different. You know, Michael Dell, he was just a college dropout. Steve Jobs, he was just another college dropout. Dean Kamen, another one of those college dropouts. College dropout. Harvard college. I love to do that. So I became very interested in the question of what must we do as parents, as teachers, as mentors, and as employers to develop the capabilities of many, many more young people to be creative problem solvers, to be innovators. We are all of us born curious, creative, imaginative. It's in our DNA. Average four-year-old probably asks 100 questions a day. But by the time that child is eight or nine, he or she has learned that it's more important to get the right answer in school than to ask questions. So what do we need to do differently? To answer that question, I took on a very different kind of research this time. I talked to a very wide range of young people in their 20s who were highly innovative in a variety of fields, some in science to technology engineering, some in the arts, some who were social entrepreneurs and innovators, thinking of ways to solve social problems. Then I studied their ecosystems, trying to understand what were the influences in their lives that had made the greatest difference. I interviewed all of their parents to see if I could discern patterns of parenting. I asked each one of them, was there a teacher or a mentor who'd made the greatest difference in their lives? Almost all of them could name at least one teacher, rarely more than one, interestingly, but at least one. The teachers ranged from elementary all the way to graduate school. I then interviewed each one of those teachers. to be disturbed by it. In every single case, all of the teachers whom I interviewed, from elementary school to graduate school, were and are outliers in their education settings, teaching in ways that were and very intentionally so, but teaching in ways I discovered that were remarkably similar to one another. Then I spent time in those few education institutions that have a real reputation for graduating highly innovative young people, 
the High Tech High network of schools in San Diego, the New Tech network, various districts around the country, the brand new Olin College of Engineering, arguably right now the best college in the country, the MIT Media, uh, the Institute of Design at Stanford. And what all of them have in common is that they're all a decade or less old, all educational startups. And what I discovered was that they, in their classrooms, are doing the same kinds of teaching that my outlier teachers described, exactly the same. Again, at all grade levels. So what I've come to understand as a fundamental challenge is that in addition to these seven survival skills, we have another problem. The culture of schooling that we have inherited and continue to pass on is radically at odds with a culture of learning that produces innovators in five essential respects. Number one, the culture of learning celebrates individual achievement. Little problem. Innovation is a team sport. Problems are too complex for individual innovators to succeed alone. And so all of these teachers built accountable teamwork into every single assignment and valued collaboration every bit as much as they valued individual achievement. Contradiction number two, we celebrate expertise. And the further you go in your education, the more you're supposed to have narrow subject content expertise. We divide and conquer the high school universe by subject areas. You go to college, you get a major. You want to teach in college? Well, you got to get a PhD. What does that mean? A PhD means you've learned this much about something that big. When I was doing my dissertation at Harvard, I was told that my dissertation should be a conversation between myself and one or two other people in the world. They'd be the only ones who would understand it, apparently. Four years for a conversation with two people, I said, no, thank you. I'll find another way to do my dissertation at Harvard, which I By contrast to that view of ex the importance of expertise, Classrooms that produce innovators are organized around problem solving using multiple disciplines. Judy Gilbert, director of talent, said to me, if there's one thing educators must realize is that problems today can neither be understood nor solved within the bright lines of individual academic disciplines. Get there from here. Contradiction number three, culture of schooling creates risk aversion, penalizing mistakes, all kinds of mistakes. But the culture of learning to become an innovator is learning how to take risks, make mistakes, and learn from them. IDEO, the most innovative design company in the world, has a motto I discovered when I visited. Their motto is fail early and fail often. Heck, way to run a company. But when I asked them about it, it became clear. They said, look, there is no innovation without trial and error. There's no innovation without the process of making mistakes. Take a quick little poll here. How many of you have learned more from your mistakes than from your successes? Raise your hands. All of us, of course. But how do we permit our students to do that? It's starting to the Institute of Design at Stanford, a fascinating interdisciplinary program, they said, yeah, we're kind of thinking F is the new A. Whoa. I don't know that your parents or kids are quite ready for that innovation <laughs> just yet. Finally, I talked to a student at Olin College who put it all in perspective for me. He said, you know, we don't talk about failure here at Olin. We talk about iteration. And it's my new favorite word, iteration, evolution, moving from 1.0 to 2.0. So I, I really think that a tremendous challenge here is how do we encourage re responsible risk taking? How do we encourage students to stretch, take sit, stretch goals? Remember what Mark Chandler said from Cisco, stretch goals. And learn from those experiences, what worked and what could have gone better, and apply that learning to their next challenge. Contradiction number four. The culture of schooling is so often a profoundly passive experience, especially the higher up you go in the education ladder. It seems the more time you spend sitting and getting, that's what we're doing today, which I'm going to stop in a moment. I almost wonder, maybe that's where we learn to be such good little consumers, because that's how we spend so much of our time in classrooms. By contrast, the culture of learning to become an innovator is all about creating, not consuming. 
where students are regularly expected to create new products, new services, solutions to problems, answers to questions, and to present those creations to audiences for review. Real products for real audiences. Lastly, and I think perhaps most important, culture of schooling relies extensively on extrinsic incentives to motivate C's and F's, GPA, and the like. Money for good grades. By contrast, I found that every single one of these young innovators whom I interviewed was far, far more intrinsically motivated, fundamentally wanting to make some kind of difference in the world. Their parents and teachers do to reinforce the intrinsic motivations we're born with, curiosity, creativity, imagination, desire to make sense of the world, all intrinsic, all in our DNA. What did they do? I discovered another pattern. Parents and teachers both had encouraged play, passion, and purpose in a kind of developmental spiral. Parents encouraging parents of young children, more ex exploratory, discovery-based play, more time that was unstructured, fewer toys, toys without batteries, sand, clay, paint, blocks, water, later Legos, limiting screen time. As the children grew older, these same parents decided it was their, their real mission to determine what was it that this kid was really interested in. What was going on in that black box? What did that ch child want to know or do or create or become? What was his or her emergent passion? Teachers did the same, built time into their regular coursework for students to, ex to do independent and team-based investigations, explorations, projects, opportunities for them to find and pursue a passion, often with a sense of adult play. It was Ed Carrier, a, a teacher of engineering uh, at Stanford University, working with master's students who talked about the importance of adding an element of whimsy into every assignment he gave kids. As these kids grew older, what I discovered was that their passions morph, they change, they iterate, I suppose you'd say. They're not, they don't stay the same. And what was important was that neither the teachers nor the parents sort of typecast the kids according to what their expressed interest was at a given moment in time. But what happened was, in every case, these kids evolved passions and interests into a deeper sense of purpose. And the sense of purpose was a desire to, in some way, make a difference or give back an expression of very clear values from teachers and parents. And at the same time, an expression of a more mature passion and an, an adult sense of play. They all think of their work as play, as but adult play, disciplined play. So let me um, wrap up here with a couple of observations. We must give young people, I believe, a foundation, a very strong foundation with three pillars, right? The first pillar is content knowledge. Of course, content knowledge matters. Of course, the only way you teach critical thinking is by engaging in rich and challenging content. There is such a thing as cultural literacy. Kids do need to be oriented to the world. I don't want kids, as some were three years ago, when the Russians invaded Georgia, to worry that South Carolina would be next, <laughs> which they did. So content knowledge matters. And historically, that has been our primary, often our exclusive focus in schools. But it's only one pillar out of three. The second pillar is skills. Skills that, that you've identified. doesn't matter whether you use my list, somebody else's, the one you've created on your own is the best, but attentiveness to skills. And with respect, the skills aren't assessed, they're just wishes. They're not real. So you have to tie assessments to skills. Pillar number three, and I'm really thinking more and more, it is probably the most important pillar. Motivation. Will. Intrinsic motivation. Because the student who has learned how to be a lifelong learner, who has a passion for learning, 
will acquire new skills and new content knowledge, new expertise on an as-needed basis. He or she will be an effective, just-in-time learner. Because whatever skills or expertise we may think we're giving will never be enough. The world is changing too quickly. So above all, motivation, which will give students the drive to learn content knowledge and expertise lifelong. We'll also give them the, the self-discipline, the perseverance, the capacity to be resilient. All of these, I think, stem from a strong foundation of motivation. So all three pillars, in my view, are equally important. And we need to think about how we teach and assess and incent all three simultaneously in every class, every day. So I'll just conclude with a couple of quick off-the-cuff suggestions for how we might, uh, first of all, assess skills. Uh, I would like to see every student start first grade with a digital portfolio that follows the students through school. And I want to see us work with students to invite them to submit their best work that is evidence of a few skills that we've decided are important, say critical thinking, collaboration, communication, learning how to learn. And what we see is a body of work that is evidence of progressive mastery over time of these skills in their digital portfolios. And we're teaching them to reflect on their learning goals and objectives and, and what they learned in a given semester and what their goals are for the next semester. So that's incorporated into the digital portfolio concept. I want to see capstone projects and exhibitions of mastery, not just senior projects, which I know you do, but I would like to see them at the end of every course, as some schools do. Evidence of skills, evidence of the ability to use and apply knowledge. In the great scheme of things, I'd like to see certificates of mastery at the end of fifth grade, eighth grade, and twelfth grade. Proficiencies. Think of the merit badge approach to learning. How do you develop a series of merit badges that show proficiency, skillfulness? In terms of motivation, uh, there's a lot we can and will, I'm sure, explore in the few coming uh, period of time together. But let me just throw one quick idea out. How many of you know about Google's 20% rule? Raise your hands. A number of you. That's good. Well, for those of you who, who may not know about it, Google gives every employee 20% time, the equivalent of one day a week, for permission to play on company time, permission to work on any project of their choice to initiate projects, to join teams, working on other projects that interest and intrigue them a day a week. And that has been their major engine of innovation. It's been where Google Docs, not uh, Google Mail, Google Earth, many of their best products have come from these voluntary um, organi organizing groups of workers pursuing their passions. What if we created the Google rule in every one of our classes, 20% time. 20% of every class, whether it's a day a week or three weeks at the end of the semester, however you figure it out, is explicitly devoted to students finding and pursuing a question, doing an investigation, becoming an expert at something that truly interests them in the context of their, the, the subject they're studying, but that we really tell students, in effect, one-fifth of your time, one-fifth of your time here over the next four years is going to be by your design, in addition to co-curriculars and so on. There's a lot more we can say. I, I think really every school, and this is to your head and to your board of trustees by extension, every school today has a professional development budget. I would like to see more of that become an R&D budget. You know, I ask superintendents or school heads, what's your R&D budget? And they laugh at me. Well, Cisco's is 13%. Microsoft's is 17%. Told you Google's is way over 20%. So I think every school needs an R&D budget. We need to um, prioritize the kind of R&D we need. I'd like to see, for example, teams of teachers put together proposals for interdisciplinary courses, put together proposals for more exhibitions of mastery or capstone projects by content area or by grade level or both. Teams of teachers putting together proposals for how teams of teachers can have shared responsibility for a group of students over time. You get the idea, R&D. So let me stop. I, I'm going to suggest that you take the next three or four minutes and talk to your neighbor 
about what you've heard thus far, what you liked, disliked, agreed with, disagreed with, but most of all, what are your questions? So take three or four minutes, and then we'll have some Q&A for the rest of our time.